Thanks a lot for, uh, for introducing me and thanks a lot for the invitation as well to speak here. I think it's really an honor and I really like the setup of, of your world as well. Uh, so it's really nice to have such a diverse audience, I think, uh, at all different places, all different time zones. So it's really an honor to speak to all of you um, today from the Netherlands um, and um, but online, of course. Uh, and what I will be talking about indeed, like Zeki already introduced about the societal readiness of quantum science and technology through science communication research. Uh, and we all know that there are uh, so many national and international efforts on quantum science and technology right now, where scientists, big tech, policy makers, investors, they're all preparing uh, really to become quantum ready as we call. Uh, and as this clearly implies a push towards uh, quantum research and development, it also comes with some kind of societal responsibility. Uh, and we think now is really the time to also involve society in, um, uh, in this process. And on the other hand, we really live a bit in a time of science skepticism. And uh, we know from climate debates, uh, from vaccine discussions, from 5G, uh, self-driving cars, that society just not always believes in science or accepts science as it is. Um, and this makes it more difficult than in the time of the classical computer to really make a new technology enter society and reach acceptance. Um, so from that perspective, I think research on the impact of quantum technology on society is highly relevant. Uh, to understand the concerns that live in society, the questions that people have, people beyond policymakers or big tech companies, uh, and acceptance in different societal groups. And that will help to push the societal uh, relevance of quantum technology also the other way around. Because if we know in an early stage what specific groups in society expect from quantum technology, uh, we can build a technology that, that fits society. So uh, in this talk, I will really discuss further the urge for um, research on quantum and society. Uh, I will shortly introduce also how my research group is embedded uh, in the Dutch national research agenda. Um, and as my group is actually still starting up, uh, I'll show you some of the results, uh, uh, including a recently published paper, which uh, some of you might have seen. Um, I think, Zeki, it's best to keep questions till the end, but if there's something really unclear, maybe please raise your hand. Uh, if you think we can't continue uh, without this point being raised, then please raise your hand uh, such that we can solve it before we go. Also, if there are technical issues such that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to interact. I think the, the Q&A is easiest to interact, but if there's anything else, please just... Uh, sure. Yeah. And then, then the virtual raise hand such that you pop up, then I can also see it. But Zeki, I'm sure you will be moderating all of this perfectly as well, if I might miss it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I want to start off with a picture that's uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, only 30 years ago, uh, this was taken. Uh, it's, a, it's a screenshot of a television program in which uh, Griet Titeler, who, uh, who used to be a scientist and a comedian, made jokes about how we would be um, uh, on the phone while on the bike. Uh, and people thought that's ridiculous. I mean, he's also really making fun. It's a, it's a comedian piece. Uh, well, now, I don't know how it's in all the countries uh, of the people that uh, that I'm talking to right now, but in the Netherlands, it's it's very normal to be calling on the bike because it's, it's very efficient. Uh, you can call and bike at the same time. Uh, and this is only 30 years ago that we thought this would be ridiculous. And also looking at what the phone looked like at uh, that time, um, uh, it, it wouldn't be possible. But right now we can even wear the earpods and just bike safely kind of, I think we're officially not allowed to do it, but everyone does it. Um, but then if quantum really becomes a technology in 30 years like this, where we think that we're not never gonna use it or that it's never gonna be mainstream and it will be mainstream. And all people hear about quantum is that it's either spooky and nobody really understands it. Um, and on the other hand, if quantum appears in the news, um, then people also hear quantum supremacy, which is a word that's supposed to be spooky and supremacy also doesn't really have a positive annotation. Um, then I think we have a problem uh, in societal uh, acceptance here. 
And from the Dutch National Research Agenda, I found this quote that if only half of the promises of quantum technology will become true, society will change dramatically. Uh, well, you would say you're connected to the Dutch National Research Agenda, you make this quote, uh, but um, I'm not the only one who thinks that society might change dramatically, and I'm not even sure if that's going to happen, but we're already on the way um, that uh, society at least gets the information that it will change dramatically. Because magazines such as Time and The Economist talk about quantum leaps, a machine that can solve problems in seconds that used to take years. The future of computing is here already. I don't think so, but this is on Time magazine, uh, this beginning of this year. Uh, and The Economist uh, talks about a mind-bending technology that goes mainstream. Well, I don't think we're mainstream yet. I think that we need to think about what happens when quantum becomes mainstream. Um, as I just introduced, I'm from the Netherlands, Leiden University and the Netherlands um, uh, has uh, worked hard in a Dutch national agenda on quantum technology in the broad sense. Um, and two years ago, the Netherlands announced a major boost for the future of quantum technology. So in 2021, uh, there was a Dutch National Growth Fund uh, awarded to Quantum Delta NL. Uh, and I'll in a bit show you uh, which, which uh, universities uh, and institutions participate in there. Um, but this was a, is a fund for seven years to really push quantum technology in the broad sense. Uh, and to give you a bit of an idea um, of uh, what, what the broad sense is, um, this is the uh, image that uh, Quantum Delta NL uses to show what they work on. So, uh, as you can see, do you see my mouse actually? Yes, we if can I move see it. it. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that will be nice. So um, uh, there, um, there are three technical challenges. So quantum computing and simulation, quantum networks, and quantum sensing that are being worked on. Uh, in different levels and th that are these action lines. So while there's obviously research and innovation to push the technology forward, there's also ecosystem and infrastructure development, human capital, which is mainly education, um, and societal uh, dialogue, which uh, can't even be written right. <laughs> uh, so there's a typo in here, uh, which uh, focuses on the ethical, legal, and societal aspects. Uh, I'm connected to uh, to the last step, so the action line four, where we really look at uh, at the societal dialogue. And uh, I think this national agenda is is um, unique or one of the very few national agendas that actually puts money um, in in the societal part of quantum technology. And we're very happy about that. So this action line. Um, uh, is centered around the Center for Quantum and Society, which is supposed to be a knowledge and co-creation center, uh, which focuses on quantum technologies for the benefit of society. So really on the, on the broader sense. Um, and I just want to show you with whom we're working on. Um, so there will also be a talk by uh, Luca Posati, who is in the group of Peter Vermaas. Uh, and our action line is uh, led by Victor Land, who is uh, managing uh, all the efforts around the ethical, legal, and societal aspects of quantum technologies in the Netherlands, which focuses on quantum awareness, tools, research, uh, and quantum for the good. Um, on this side, we have the people that are more on the uh, on the practical side of the uh, ethical, legal, and societal implications. So uh, the Boer Nas, for example, is really the lead of the uh, Center for Quantum and Society. Ulrich Mans is on the uh, on the policy and relations side. Uh, and then uh, Fania is about communications and Daniel is from a platform which also focuses on how to put uh, technology in, um, in society. And then on the other side, we have the people that really focus on the research. So I focus mostly on science communication uh, in Leiden. Peter van Maas focuses on uh, the ethical implications in Delft and Joost van Hoboken focuses on the legal implications um, in Amsterdam. Uh, so back to Leiden, uh, this is the map of the Netherlands. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in the Netherlands. Uh, and I don't know how many of you actually know that Delta stands for um, Delft, Amsterdam, 
Leiden, Twente uh, en Eindhoven. Zo kwam de Delta is een effort between mostly five cities. Uh, Leiden is hier on the site and uh, this is the building that I'm working in at Leiden University. You're all very welcome to visit one day, but at least from here, from this building right now, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm talking to you. Uh, and the focus of my research group is really on um, the entanglement between quantum and society. So we really want quantum and society to interact, to exchange and to kind of become one as entangled particles are uh, in our quantum world. Um, and to do so, uh, yeah, we're really exploring this boundary between quantum and society from a science communication perspective. Uh, and as this is a quite new direction of research, we're doing it from uh, all uh, with all different types of research. So we look at how quantum is currently uh, popularized and communicated to different groups in society, what the expectations and attitudes uh, towards quantum are uh, in, uh, in society, how, uh, for example, metaphors uh, um, are accepted, both by experts as well as by, by, uh, by lay people. Uh, we want to look at outreach that is existent or is developed uh, empirically and what the impact is. Um, and with that, we really want to explore the science communication of quantum technology in the broad sense. Uh, in this talk, I will mainly talk about how quantum technology is currently popularized and a little bit about the expectations and attitudes towards quantum because that's what we've been focusing on in the past um, two years. So let's first go into uh, the popularization of quantum science and technology. Um, and for that, we have really looked into what are good popularization channels um, in which uh, people talk about quantum um, and which we can analyze. Uh, and my PhD student, Aletta Meinsma, looked into how quantum science and technology is popularized in, in TEDx talks. Um, and TEDx talks are an interesting platform because they're open, it's open, it's online, uh, it's accessible, and you can also uh, access uh, the transcripts uh, of these talks. Um, and uh, they're given by people who want to popularize um, uh, a topic in technology. In this case, we've looked into how quantum science and technology is popularized. And to find out what to research uh, when looking at the popularization of, uh, of TEDx talks, Aletta has first looked into which potential issues um, might possibly be there um, in, uh, in the popularization of quantum science and technology. Uh, and there are three main issues that, that uh, might occur. Uh, so the first is proposed by Peter Vermaas, which is that quantum might be called spooky or enigmatic, uh, a bit far away from our imagination, um, and that might create a distance to society. So it might not be good to talk about quantum from a spooky or enigmatic frame. Uh, another issue uh, that was proposed by Grimbaum uh, is that the underlying quantum theory might not be explained. And that if, the, if it's not explained, there's not enough connection because people just feel like, okay, it's talking over their heads or it's not really something you need to think further about. So um, uh, that's another proposition. And the third one is that um, about quant the the quantum is discussed in a narrow way if, it, uh, if we're talking about society, so really about economic benefits uh, or a race in quantum and not really about the benefits for society um, as a whole. So this is the starting point of the research on how quantum is uh, popularized. Uh, and then uh, Aletta has done a content analysis in which she first really searched for all the videos uh, which had quantum, uh, which appeared when uh, looking for quantum in the TEDx channel on YouTube. This gave over 4,000 um, YouTube videos. Uh, then again, checking if uh, quantum was actually uh, uh, occurred in the transcript, then only 1,000 uh, talks popped up. Um, then checking if the if the transcript was readable. So there were some that were automatically transcribed, actually a lot, uh, and some were manually transcribed. And uh, I learned from Aletta who did the data analysis that when it's automatically transcribed, there's no punctuation. So that took some time. 
Uh, but finally, uh, she selected TEDx talks for the relevance of the study um, and, uh, and punctuation was restored. And the final data set had 501 TEDx talks uh, of which another eight were excluded during the coding phase. So um, um, she really watched and uh, read the transcripts uh, of 501 TEDx talks to find out how quantum is popularized in, uh, in TEDx talks. Uh, and I'll shortly discuss the results. So first about the data. Uh, so TEDx is a platform with talks that can occur all over the world. Uh, and the, the, the videos that were in the data set were all from 55 different countries, but still about 80% of the talks are from the US and Europe. So they're not a full representation of the world, although they're from all different countries. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it still is good. Um, and 73% uh, of these talks, so 15% included a mystical viewpoint, so more a holistic view uh, on, on quantum technology rather than talking about the technology uh, itself, which made uh, that, that most of the coding could not be done because it's not about technology really, but maybe about how the brains interact um, through quantum. Uh, and uh, we, we did not include that in, in most of the questions of the coding. Uh, so what's interesting is that uh, actually uh, there were three different types of speakers uh, indicated. Uh, experts, non-experts and people for whom it was difficult to find out uh, what, why they gave the talk, if they were an expert or an, a non-expert. Uh, quantum experts could be uh, researchers such as, for example, Stephanie Weiner, who is a theoretical uh, quantum physicist and computer scientist, uh, but non-experts could be the whole range, including, for example, uh, this uh, uh, Babar Af Afsal, who is a shepherd, uh, and then there were also people for whom we don't know. Uh, and interestingly, only 38% of the speakers were actually experts um, on quantum science and technology. So most of the speakers were, uh, were non-experts are unknowns. And we also looked at the differences between the experts and the non-experts uh, in this research. So now you might remember these three issues uh, on, uh, um, on popularizing quantum science and technology. And the first issue, uh, whether um, quantum has uh, been framed as spooky or enigmatic, occurred only in 23% of the talks. So for example, everything quantum is spooky and weird. Then we also thought it might be because Einstein called quantum spooky, uh, but uh, this quote only uh, was in 18 of the 115 talks that, um, that mentioned quantum as being spooky. Uh, so 11 experts used that um, uh, and then also non-experts. But experts did frame statistically more often than non-experts um, quantum as being spooky or enigmatic, something that's difficult to understand. Uh, but not maybe as much as you would expect it to be. So only a quarter of the talk. Um, then the other issue that underlying technology, the theory would not be explained. Um, well, actually in over half of the talks, quantum concepts are explained. And we looked at the explanation of superposition, entanglement and um, contextuality. So uh, whether uh, that's more like the measurement um, if a measurement was done and what, what's the effect on a quantum state. Uh, most of the talks um, explained uh, superposition. Uh, and as you see here, it was most of the 45% of the talks that include a quantum 2.0 indicator, which means uh, that, that it's, uh, it's about quantum technology rather than about um, first applications of quantum or quantum theory. 25% of the talks that include such an indicator uh, explain the concepts of entanglement uh, and 24% again in, uh, uh, explain it when uh, explain contextuality. And interestingly, experts almost always uh, explain underlying quantum theory concepts. So 70% of the experts um, uh, explain underlying concepts ra rather than non-experts, only 28%. Uh, and the last potential issue was uh, if um, 
if the talks are mostly focusing on the narrow public good frame, so about economic benefits um, rather than uh, for society as a whole. And this we really see. So uh, the social progress frame, so how uh, to make the world a better place with quantum mechanics, as one of the speakers said, uh, occurred in only 7% of the talks. Uh, also only 5% of the talks actually talked about uh, a race towards building a new quantum technology. Uh, so this is really about winning the race. Uh, but then, um, while 34% of the talks talked about benefits uh, of applications in quantum technology, so how quantum is con going to solve problems that are impossible with classical computer, only 5% of the talks actually explicitly warn for a, a risk. So it's somewhat, somewhat worrisome, for example. Um, and finally, a fourth issue that uh, that might uh, might be there, which I didn't discuss, is that um, there might be a focus on quantum computing. This was also mentioned by um, Tara Robertson. So there, while there are three uh, directions of quantum technology, at least that the Netherlands is focusing on computing, communication, um, and sensing and metrology, um, there might be a focus on computing and in the talks this was clearly the case so a quarter of the talks uh, talked about quantum computing and simulation while only six percent talked about communication and only two percent talked uh, about sensing and metrology and that that's that happens both with uh, experts and non-experts so they both focus on quantum computing and uh, and simulation so this is only one type of popularization, global, although with a focus on uh, on Europe and the US. But we thought it would be interesting to see if there's a, another type of popularization in which we could test these frames as well. Uh, so with that, we did a follow-up in Dutch newspapers. So how is uh, quantum communicated in Dutch newspapers, uh, newspaper articles? Uh, this is mostly done by Lette Meins, by the PhD student, and Thomas Roth, who is a master student in collaboration with me, Goedin Reiniers, who is a linguist, and uh, Janneke Smeets, who is the head of our department. Um, and we looked at uh, how quantum was framed in, uh, in these newspapers uh, that for the Dutch people might be recognizable, but these are the six uh, biggest newspapers in the Netherlands. Uh, first, they found uh, almost 700 articles in the range of 2009 to 2021, and this was also the, the, the range of years um, of the TEDx talks that we looked at. And then from these articles, we took a sample of 385 news articles. Um, and this data has not been published yet, but I want to compare the news, uh, newspaper project with, uh, with the TEDx talks to also see how popularization occurs uh, on different platforms. Because TEDx talks are given by speakers um, who decide about their own story and um, immediately share it with the audience. And although most of the speakers were non-experts, there were a lot of experts giving their own talks, while well, newspaper articles are written by journalists. Um, so looking at the four different uh, potential issues that we discussed, um, the spooky and enigmatic frame occurred in 24% uh, of the newspaper articles and 23% of the TEDx talks. So that's, uh, that's really similar. Uh, for the underlying quantum te uh, theory not being explained, again, so half of the talks, um, uh, and one should be the, the articles, so half of the talks explained underlying theories and in the newspapers, that was also the case. For the narrow public good frame, we see that um, there are also very similar numbers. So on both uh, platforms, benefits were mentioned the most um, and the other frames did not occur that much. Um, and uh, uh, there was even more skew towards the focus on quantum computing. Uh, in the newspaper article compared to the TEDx article. So I think it's very interesting to compare these platforms uh, with each other because they are also different, uh, different types of platforms, different types of communicators. Uh, and still, uh, so we see that these potential issues are very similar between these two platforms. What I will also talk about in a bit is to see if these are actually issues. 
So we're going to test where there are these issues that we now know occur um, in popularization of quantum science and technology are actually a problem or not. Uh, with another uh, project coming up in the popularization of quantum science and technology um, is on metaphors in quantum. Um, so we really want to see if metaphors on quantum science and technology are beneficial uh, for understanding uh, quantum science and technology for the acceptance or for the, the discussion around it uh, for different groups of people. And interestingly, this is a meme that I shared um, on, uh, on Twitter recently uh, when I was uh, actually sharing the position for the postdoc position on uh, studying these metaphors. So it's about quantum entanglement is not hard to understand. Socks come in pairs. If you put a sock on your left foot, the other sock of the pair immediately becomes the right sock, no matter where it is located in the universe. And then the applicants um, that showed up uh, for this position said that it really helped uh, in their understanding. And, and we were looking for linguists specifically, so people without a quantum background. But there was a lot of discussion uh, on Twitter about it. So people said, well, what if, if, you put, if someone else puts it on the left foot too? Um, but this is not at all how quantum technology works. Um, some people really like it. It's very interesting. Well, the whole point is that it's not like a pair of socks. So it's really um, uh, about how people perceive such metaphors and whether it's right or wrong to explain quantum science and technology in terms of a metaphor uh, very much depends on the audience. Uh, and I think it will be very interesting to look into that. So the postdoc working on that will be starting September. We hired the person. Um, so hopefully uh, this will be coming up. Stay tuned. Um, then in uh, the uh, remaining time of this talk, uh, I will talk a bit about the attitudes toward quantum science and technology, because we now looked at how quantum science and technology is communicated to society, but how does society and different groups in society actually feel about quantum science and technology. Um, this is a bit harder to study. We did a pilot uh, in a neighborhood in Leiden uh, when we uh, had access to this neighborhood uh, through a festival uh, on quantum uh, technology. And we asked the people uh, before entering uh, this festival in their neighborhood, so it was really like a low barrier to join, uh, how they feel about um, quantum technology. Um, do they think it will influence their life and how much do they think they can, can influence it? And I, I think this data shows very well that while people strongly agree and think that quantum technology will influence their lives, um, they do not really feel they can influence it themselves. So these are the red bars. They feel they can, cannot uh, influence quantum science and technology. Uh, this data is collected by uh, a master's student and analyzed by another master's student, and we're currently working out um, all the details. Uh, but I think this already showed that there's a very much of a difference how much people expect that this new technology will influence their lives. As we call a, it a disruptive technology, we talk about quantum supremacy, uh, but it doesn't really feel like um, it's close to them. Um, and uh, another uh, project that we did was with uh, a workshop with citizens. So uh, Therese Franse, uh, our postdoctoral researcher, um, invited a group of people to talk about the technology of the future. So we did not really introduce quantum technology uh, when uh, inviting these people. Uh, and we asked them really to openly discuss quantum technology in the future scenarios without giving them much uh, information. And as a quantum physicist, I thought this was really interesting to see how little information people actually need to discuss how they feel about the future of such a technology. Uh, and they talked a lot about emotions. We also used emojis, as you can see uh, on this picture, to, to start a discussion in which uh, emotions could play a role. And while people were talking about fascination and hope, there was also fear, worry, and confusion. Uh, and the key values that people uh, talked about when talking about quantum technology was about knowledge, safety, privacy, health, and sustainability. So really future values that are important to them. 
Uh, they also made their scenarios in 3D. So this is the scenario for quantum sensing, uh, where there's a person on an island uh, and they're all different sensors connected. Some sensors go nowhere because we don't know where to bring them. Some uh, outputs are not connected. Uh, so it's really like, what will the future of sensing look like? And this was really about the person uh, for health reasons. Uh, and there were all different scenarios um, that people came up with. Uh, and I think this also shows the uh, the multidisciplinarity of, of this research field of between quantum and society. So this was really from a philosophical point of view, looking at what the future of quantum technology will look like according to society. So very much of um, a qualitative study, while the, um, the TEDx and the newspaper article is really a quantitative study. Uh, soon we'll be uh, testing based on the frames that we found in the TEDx and newspaper article, um, how these issues uh, actually, um, uh, uh, what the effect is on the engagement of people uh, dependent on these, uh, on these frames. So we give different texts with different frames uh, to a sample of the Dutch population. Uh, and with a questionnaire that's also validated, um, we'll check if there's a difference in feeling engaged with quantum technology dependent on the frame that people get. So this is a, this is a next step in measuring engagement. So finally, uh, I want to discuss a few things that our research group here in Leiden also does, uh, which is not directly research, but that's think, I think still interesting uh, for the people who are here. So some of the uh, noteworthy activities that we do. <laughs> so one of the things that I really enjoyed a lot was interacting with um, quite a random group of people. So usually when we organize a festival, a science festival uh, or a themed um, activity on, on quantum or physics in the broad sense, it's usually um, at the university or at the science museum. Uh, so people face a bit of a barrier to go there. Uh, but last year, the Netherlands of uh, Leiden uh, as a city had, uh, was city of science. Um, and that meant that every single day there was a different theme living in the city uh, and the neighborhoods could, um, could adopt these themes. Uh, and one of the themes on the 14th of April, so World Quantum Day was, um, uh, was, was quantum. And it was adopted by a neighborhood in Leiden. Um, and the day was also organized by uh, a, a group of volunteers from the neighborhood and we helped them organize it. So we really went to the neighborhood and had a festival in which we had some uh, talks about quantum. So here you also see Aletta Meinva uh, talk about quantum. Uh, but there were also things organized by the neighborhood itself. So there was someone who made quantum soup. I, uh, and uh, so she made her interpretation of what quantum would look like if it would be a soup. Uh, and we asked people to um, give uh, their opinion about quantum. And I can highly recommend to organize such events together with local communities because um, uh, a lot of people showed up from young to old. They were also really liked the interaction with their fellow neighbors. So even though maybe the topic wasn't that attractive to them, in the end, they had a great day and they learned something about quantum. They shared their opinion about quantum, but they also interacted with, with their neighbors just on an afternoon in their own neighborhood. Uh, another thing that we organized uh, recently, very low key, was a workshop on uh, exploring the role of hype in the future of quantum technology. So with a, a group of young researchers, uh, we had a full day of discussions on what the role of hype will be, also related to the ethical, legal and societal aspects of quantum technology. And this will be uh, continued. So if you're interested in uh, talking further about it, please feel free to contact me. Um, and another thing that uh, that I and we find very important is uh, diversity in quantum science and technology. That's why I'm the co-founder of Women in Quantum uh, um, Development, which also has a website and social media. You can connect to that. And there's a monthly and online inspirational talk by um, uh, mostly women in quantum, uh, but we're open to everyone who feels um, they like these inspirations and they're also a live session. So feel free to keep an eye on what Wicked is doing um, in the future. And looking ahead, 
uh, our group will uh, focus on the popular, uh, popularizing uh, quantum further. So we really will see what, uh, what different engagements, uh, what different framings do with the engagement of people. And we also look at metaphors in quantum science and technology. If you have nice metaphors, share them. Uh, because we're really interested in, uh, in finding out uh, which metaphors work and don't work uh, on quantum uh, science and technology. Um, we'll also look more into outreach. So we'll measure the impact of an online Dutch national quantum course, which will be launched, I think, in September. And we'll also be hosting uh, um, a, a gala, which is a bit of a theater evening on quantum and society uh, in the Netherlands uh, next year. And we look further into the role uh, of hype and the occurrence of hype um, of quantum and technology. So finally, uh, I want to thank all the people that I've been working with in the past years. Uh, so I have a, a, a team of people who are working on all these teams and we're really uh, kicking off now. So hopefully um, in the future, you'll hear much more from us. And we also have great collaborators uh, with whom it was impossible to do such interdisciplinary research as a physicist. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time uh, to listen. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. Thanks. 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 Uh, it was a great talk. And uh, what you have been doing is, I think, it's actually uh, very impressive. Uh, so let's move to the, the questions. I think we already have one in the chat. Uh, so the question is, popularizing quantum to public comes at the price of oversimplifying some things, maybe even saying completely wrong things. How much is beneficial and acceptable? So what, what about the trade-off between simplification and reaching out to public? Yeah, thanks a lot for this question. So this is also really about what your goal is. So um, uh, we often uh, talk about the deficit model in science communication research, which is the idea that uh, the public is like an empty vessel. Well, uh, science is a, is a full vessel and there's a deficit between these vessels. So we need to fill the vessel of society to make a dialogue um, uh, possible or to even help society grow further because they just have a a knowledge gap. Um, but on the other hand, um, what do people actually need to know about quantum technology in the future? It's, it's an open question, I think. We don't know what people need to know to use this technology, to accept this technology, and also to be able to uh, specify their needs of this future technology. So popularizing quantum can be broad. Um, and it's also the question, what what do you want to achieve with it do you want people to know more or do you want people to have a say and do you want people to use it because what is embedded in a smartphone and how this technology works in detail i think we all don't know in detail as much as the people who develop a smartphone for example uh, but also it's not that important um, even for so for developers of apps uh, they don't need to know all the details of what um, the hardware of the phone does. And I think it's it's important to realize that. So it's not about filling society with more knowledge that's all correct and all right. And, and people need to be able to do all the calculations, but to have an equal say in what the future will look like. Uh, does that answer your question? No. Yeah. Let's see whether Omar agrees or not. Can I, <laughs> can I ask a... Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, Luca. Please go ahead. So, thank you for so much for this uh, for this talk. Uh, I had a I had a very how to say a question that is uh, not uh, directly linked to to popularizing and dissemination. It's more linked to teaching teaching uh, quantum technologies. Well, how can we make uh, researchers and students? Uh, understand the importance of considering ethical and societal issues in the study and in research about quantum technologies. And what do you think about this problem? How can we teach quantum technologies? So just again, is your question, how can we teach quantum technologies or how can no, we how make can we teach 
the question of the ethical and societal issues about quantum technologies? Yeah, thanks a lot for this question. Um, so um, that's, I think it's, it's, it's also again about what your goal is. So it really depends on the group. I think everyone uh, working on quantum science and technology should be aware of the ethical, legal and societal aspects of quantum, but not everyone should be become an expert in that. So I think uh, partly it's awareness and maybe even a guest lecture or a, a single project or group discussion would be enough for some groups, in my opinion. Um, uh, so this is not a research, uh, uh, not embedded in research in that sense, but I think that's my opinion. And I think to reach that, uh, we should share, um, uh, spread awareness about the ethical, legal and societal aspects. So I I'm a quantum physicist by training. Um, uh, I did my PhD in, in, in quantum and science and technology, which makes it kind of easy for me to access the community. Also right now I'm uh, in the physics building, so I'm associated with the uh, physics institute. I walk around, I teach students here. Uh, so for me, um, it, it, there's a low barrier to actually reach uh, our physics students. And I think that's what we need to do a bit. Uh, and I, I'm aware that for me it's it's rather easy, uh, but we need to generate awareness. And for that, we need to talk to faculty mostly, faculty staff, uh, about the importance and to ask if we can give a get, guest lecture or propose a project. Uh, I do now have a master's. So Thomas Roth, who is also here on the picture, um, is uh, a master's student um from physics who's studying the science communication aspect so he did the newspaper project and right now he's doing an ai project on uh on quantum technology and i think that's also great to have uh, students who actually major in physics or or, or computer science um but uh do a project which which has more uh, a societal impact but not all of them need to do it okay thank you thank you so much Thanks, thanks, Jure. thanks, Luca, for the question. Uh, so uh, maybe you missed this. Jure. Yesterday we had Karasi from uh, Women in Quantum Development also gave oh, yeah. a talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was very nice. And I'm going to connect this to the next question. So this is from uh, Rafael Vasquez. Uh, hello, as a woman in quantum, what is your opinion on men in quantum? And in what mm -hmm. cases do you prefer to work with a woman or a man in quantum? So is there is there a difference between you know, the general attitudes and the way that people interact. I know this is a very general question because, you know, globally, it, there's a very divergent uh, field, yeah. but uh, so it's, yeah. Yeah, I, thanks for asking the question. Um, uh, so uh, on paper, I don't, I don't really care because I think there's a more difference between different women and different men than there is between men and women. Uh, we know that. Uh, but obviously there are differences between uh, men and women. And I, I think from research, it also shows that diverse teams are beneficial. Uh, so for me personally, I, uh, I have really great experiences working with men as well as working with women. So actually my two biggest role models in academia are first my promoter, Ronald Hanson, who is uh, a man. Um, and he has uh, shown really great leadership and role modeling during my PhD. And I think without him, I would have never sit, been in academia and been uh, stayed in quantum science and technology. Uh, my other greatest role model is a woman, Jolika Smeet, who is also on the picture here, uh, who is the department head of science communication and society. So uh, it's more about the individuals rather than the gender, uh, in, in my opinion. Thank you. And uh, maybe this is the last question, but uh, Omar asked, what is exactly meant by ethics in quantum? I, yeah, I'm seeing Luca not. I think this is a question for Luca rather than for me. I don't know if I can pass it on. Uh, so I'm really studying the science communication uh, and outreach on quantum technology. Well, Luca is more on the ethics side. Yeah, so maybe we can say that just save this question uh, for Luca's talk because he will be speaking in uh, as, as the fifth speaker. Uh, or there's the fifth talk for today. And uh, okay, so I think there is one more question if you want to answer it. So aiming for something when it comes to societal understanding of quantum makes me wonder how is quantum different from 
any other disruptive technology innovation in history. So we, this is a topic that we discuss a lot, you know that. And mm -hmm. most of us uh, don't even know how things in our daily lives work. So my question is what makes quantum special so that more people need to pay more attention to it than other technologies coming up? I think this is a very timely question in the in the face that we are all facing with all this you know, chat GPT, AI, you know, synthetic biology and these kind of, uh, you know, what makes quantum special or is it special or is it just one of the many developing technologies? Yeah, it's a really good question. And like Shaki also says, it's something that we're discussing a lot. And I think it's uh, in one sense, indeed, it's one of the developing technologies. Um, it's a technology that, so it's a term that has been there for a while. So already over 100 years ago, quantum science was there, but now that becomes like a technology out there. So for most people on the street, the concept of quantum isn't new, but they, they didn't need to interact with it. It was just for like, these physicists in their I3 tower, while now it becomes a thing. Um, and I think, so there are a few different differences, but all different technologies um, have their their things, right? And we also really look at how AI is communicated. And uh, so, for example, we've written a white paper on uh, lessons learned from communicating AI, such that we can take that along in uh, communicating quantum. So it's not really that we're living on an island, only studying how quantum uh, is and should be communicated. Um, but there's also not, so the, it's not like the landing on the moon, for example, that there will be a day at which quantum technology will be there and there will be a day before and the day after quantum. So it's really more like something that, um, that comes in more uh, gradually. Also, we don't know a lot about the application. So there's still a lot of open ends. Uh, which makes it sometimes hard to have a discussion about it because people really like to know what does it actually really entail. Uh, but research on science communication really shows that you should uh, connect to possible future stakeholders in an early stage. Um, so I don't think quantum is like unique, uh, but I do think that it is important to be aware of the societal impact and to think about that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so let's see whether Luis uh, wants to ask a follow-up question or... If not, maybe I can ask the final question uh, regarding this, uh, you know, kind of value exploration workshops. Uh, are you specifically uh, focused on organizing them uh, on-site or are you thinking about a way to expand it to organizing more 